against police brutality and terror in black and brown and poor communities, most recently spurred by the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. This event is sponsored by the Black Law Students Association, the Latin American Law Students Association, the Asian Pacific American Law Students Association, Women of Color Collective, American Civil Liberties Union, National Lawyers Guild, Human Rights Law Society, Outlaw, and the Duke Immigrant and Refugee Project. Again, in case you're just joining us, we ask that all of our attendees turn off their video feature and stay muted because this event is being recorded. At the end of our event, our panelists are gonna stick around for a Q&A. So please feel free to send your questions to our moderator via chat. Our moderator, Professor Brandon Garrett, is the L. Neal Williams Jr. Professor of Law at Duke University Law School, where he leads the Duke Center for Science and Justice. He is a leading scholar on criminal justice outcomes, evidence, and constitutional rights. He's involved with a number of law reform initiatives, including the American Law Institute's Project on Policing. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Professor Garrett. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much, Lee, and thank all of you for joining us. Thanks to all the groups that made this event uh, possible. It's an incredible coalition and hard work was done to put together this incredible panel, which I'm going to introduce. And we have a number of really questions about the urgent topics that are facing our country and our communities right now. Uh, we have with us James Birch. He is the policy director for the Anti-Police Terror Project, which is an all-volunteer organization that seeks to end police violence in black and brown communities. James is a graduate of Georgetown University Law Center, and James has previously worked with the Southern Center for Human Rights and Frisco 500. In 2018, James served as policy coordinator for the Cat Brooks for Oakland mayoral campaign. James has also worked as the policy director for the St. James Infirmary, a peer-based occupational health and safety clinic for sex workers of all genders. So thank you, James. We have with us also Professor Daryl Miller, uh, Melvin G. Shim, Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Intellectual Life here at Duke Law School. Professor Miller is an expert on civil rights. He teaches civil rights litigation here at the law school, constitutional law, civil procedure, state and local government, legal history. Professor Miller was recently elected to the American Law Institute. They just announced that last week. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, Daryl also directs our Center for Firearms Law. And Professor Christy Lopez, uh, third panelist, is a professor from practice at Georgetown Law. Professor Lopez served as deputy chief in the special litigation section of the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice. Uh, there, Professor Lopez led investigations into various police departments, including the Ferguson Police Department. And I know Christy, as, she, as part of our team on the ALI project on policing that Lee mentioned in the introduction. So um, we have some very meaty questions, which I wanna turn over to our panelists to, uh, to address for, for all of you attending. And we look forward to your questions as well. The first question, uh, which we wanted to take some time to, to think about and talk about is, what does defund the police mean? And are there examples of municipal defunding programs that we can use to help us understand what, what defund the police means. So, who would like to start off? Uh, I'm happy to. Uh, uh, and thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, thanks to uh, Lee for uh, uh, personally inviting me here. Uh, thanks to Duke Law uh, uh, and all of the sponsors for having us. I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, it certainly is a treat. Um, when the Anti-Police Terror Project started our defund campaign, defund OPD campaign four years ago, uh, we used the phrase defund police to create a framework for people who don't share our perception of law enforcement. Uh, many people, especially older folks, grew up in communities that venerate law enforcement. It's considered to be an honorable profession. Um, when you're a little kid, you might uh, wanna dress up as a cop for Halloween. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, police are enshrined in a certain, uh, way that has people see them with integrity and honor that's just very different from the community where I grew up. You know, when I grew up, when I was a very uh, a small child, uh, uh, my mother told me uh, uh, never to let the police in my house without a warrant. That's the first thing I learned about the police. And I must've been, you know, uh, uh, four or five years old at the time. And so uh, there needs to be a way to bridge that ideological gap. Uh, and that's why uh, we chose defunding the police, right? When I say, please don't keep me safe, uh, people don't really understand what I'm saying who are outside of my framework. So when I shift the framework to uh, police are a bad investment, we should defund them and invest in things that truly keep us safe, uh, people start to understand. 
right? So I want to be clear, APTP is an abolitionist organization. I'm an abolitionist. I don't believe in this current system of policing at all uh, and believe the optimal public safety system needs to be developed from the ground up. But that being said, I also know that the process I envision doesn't happen overnight. There's an incredible amount of work that needs to be done to begin to develop the systems that will replace policing. Uh, and that, with that being said, I currently know that there's a large amount of policing activity that everyone can agree is unnecessary, right? So the defund the police movement in my eyes was a way to move first on the areas we all agree upon so we can invest the hundreds of millions of dollars that major municipalities give to law enforcement into organizations, programs, and departments that truly keep us safe, right? So using Oakland as an example, Oakland's police department gets 46% of our general fund every year. Uh, that's over $330 million. And that's also more than the combined budgets of human services, transportation, housing and community development, libraries, parks and recreation, youth development, economic and workforce development, and race and equity combined. And it's very similar in cities across the country. And even worse, a lot of the cities with those budgets can't sustain them. Uh, they have underfunded medical and pension insurance liabilities that are gonna bankrupt them if, if, if nothing changes, uh, especially in light of the current economic crisis. Cities really need to defund the police uh, to maintain economic viability. And so uh, looking at it from the anti-police terror projects perspective, it was, it was, I think this is a way for us to show, uh, uh, to kind of draw out the contradiction that is the amount of money we invest in policing as a society at this current time. So I'll, I'll weigh in. Um, uh, just uh, for a moment, I, I think, uh, I mean, the question is, what does defund the police mean? And uh, as James says, um, you know, there's a, there's a broad, broad spectrum um, of opinion as to what the, that uh, programmatically means. Uh, it could mean something um, uh, like uh, police abolition to, to some listeners, that is the uh, elimination of the um, municipal and, uh, and uh, county uh, and even uh, federal policing uh, apparatus and the beginning with something new. Uh, it could mean um, a reallocation of the resources that, um, uh, that James was talking about uh, from uh, policing to other types of social services. Um, and so I think that's one of the, I mean, one of the issues, and I'm glad that we're having this conversation about, um, you know, trying to figure out on what's on the table when that, when people say defund the police, I think it's a coalition of a lot of different um, philosophies and ideas about what those words mean. I guess I, there's not a lot to add. That was a, uh, those were. I mean, I, um, those definitions make a lot of sense to me. The only thing I might add is that um, I think that the language of defunding is important, in part because it does help us move, um, helps us think about how we are talking about more than just making policing better. We're not reforming it in terms of like making police work better. We're talking about fundamentally restructuring it. And I think that, that um, part of that includes recognizing how much we've come to over rely on policing for public safety. And, I, and, the only, and so the only thing I would sort of add to what's been said is that I sometimes feel when people have a reaction against the, the ideas behind defunding, there's this sense that the people pro, um, proposing them are, are naive or overly optimistic about the need for public safety, which is ironic given the people who are um, are promoting um, defunding and, and police abolition are the people I think who are in many respects most acutely aware of the need for public safety and will have most acutely felt the failures of our current approach to public safety. And so I just want to underscore that when we talk about defunding the police, we are not denying the need for, for, for mechanisms and systems to keep us safe. We're just saying, hey, maybe we can do better. You know, maybe mass incarceration and 10 million arrests you know, a year and all the harm that entails isn't getting us where we need to be. And we should be a little bit more creative and a little bit more empathetic and a little bit more expansive in our thinking about other ways to achieve public, uh, public safety. So I just wanted to underscore that because I think it's one of the things that, you know, you can't say it too many times, it gets lost um, all the time in this conversation, I feel like. Great, thank you, thank you each. Um, we'd like to go around again uh, and talk about the goals of defunding the police and you've touched on that some already. And the second part of the, this question 
has to do with police violence and use of force, which has been front and center this summer. So how does defunding the police contribute to the reduction of police violence and use of force? Thoughts on that on larger goals and goals specific to, to police violence? I think again, the goal uh, is for us to really reimagine public safety. Uh, as all the panelists have said, we're kind of caught in this mindset that police keep us safe uh, but when we really look at the numbers uh, and the metrics, we find that they they don't. Um, you know, I think people, you know, in the media popularizes this image of police as violence interrupters. Uh, and for those of us in, in the work, we know that this doesn't happen. You know, it's it's they respond to what has happened. Uh, uh, and so uh, those of us in the work also know that uh, in, that I think it's the latest numbers I saw are, are, are about sixty percent at least in California, it's estimated that 60% of those uh, killed by law enforcement are undergoing mental health crises, right? So when we talk about defunding the police, we're also talking about taking the roles that we've given to police out of their hands, you know, starting with those most glaringly obvious, right? You know, police are not mental health experts. You know, crisis intervention training does not substitute for a, a life of uh, of work in the area of understanding what it is to be in mental health crisis and how to de-escalate people when they're in crisis, right? So I know, for instance, in California, there are a number of people talking about models that will not include law enforcement uh, uh, when it comes to engaging in folks in mental health crises and giving that role uh, to the people who deserve it. And so whether it's interpersonal violence or mental health crises or serving the unhoused communities, uh, uh, especially those in the Bay Area, so there are a lot of things that police are doing that they really have no business doing at all. Uh, and so we, we, we like to start there. Great. So I'm happy to Listeners, by the way, who aren't familiar with crisis intervention training, it's CIT, it's a, a type of training and movement to provide police with the skills that behavioral health professionals might have. And then there's a question, well, one could also just bring in behavioral health professions or divert people to behavioral health professionals. There are questions about how good the training is and how experienced officers can possibly be based on a brief CIT training. There are also more intensive models. Sorry, Christy. Yeah, and just to that point, I mean, there's also models, um, you know, that have been sort of overtaken by the CIT model, but that actually began when, when the mental health crisis response teams began, they were actually teaming up men, actual mental health workers with officers um, to allow the mental health workers to take the lead um, and then having the officers there essentially as backup. And of course, there are also mobile crisis teams and the whole idea behind that is to, is to, is to, get to, is to prevent something from um, becoming a, a situation where people think that, that, that police um, intervention might be required. Um, so I think, I think a couple of things about um, specifically is how defunding relates to police use of violence. I think there are a couple of things that I keep in, I like to keep in mind. One is, I don't, I don't know, I think we need to be careful when we think that if we just have fewer police, we'll have less police violence. Um, we have seen examples of where, I've certainly seen examples of that in almost, honestly, in almost every investigation I did, I would see where police, off, police departments were getting smaller and yet the level of force and the level of officer involved shootings often went up. Um, we, that happened in California in Vallejo where they just, they split, they cut the number of officers in about half from about 150 to about 80 and officers involved shootings and crime went way up. Um, and so I think we have to be think, very mindful um, that when we're talking about defunding, you know, um, and Rachel Herzing and many, many others are very, you know, th this is a very consistent um, a mantra among abolitionists and defunders is that you have to also be building up. You can't just be um, defunding police. If you don't do that simultaneous building up, you know, things don't work out well. So you have to, it requires you to be very mindful and not, and, 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 and you can't just think, oh, with fewer police, we'll have less police violence. That's just not the way it has worked out in, in many situations. And I think it's a really important cautionary tale as people are advocating for defunding um, going forward. I also think it's important, and, and this is the reformist in me talking, but um, uh, you know, I believe that there are such things as non-reformist reforms, and I believe that there is a responsibility to try to prevent police harm that is happening in the near term. I also believe there's a responsibility to have a larger, more um, imaginative uh, goal um, in, for the long term, because I don't think that the current system as currently organized is, is 
what is the best we can do. Um, so I think, but I do think that we should be working, in my view, we should be working on um, immediate changes, immediate reforms to reduce the impact of police violence. And for me, that includes things that, um, you know, from training to changes in policy to changes in how we um, allow the responsibility and authority we give to police. And I think the, the thing to think about in the context of defunding is to always be mindful of in making this immediate change, am I further entrenching systems that I don't want to further entrench? And to do the, you know, the best that you can to seek immediate relief and immediate reform and remedy without further entrenching. So for example, maybe you do retraining, but maybe you don't build a $95 million training center, right? There are different <laughs> approaches you can do. Um, and you have to really be thinking about um, you know, which approach you take um, but I don't think, I think it's really important not to just say, we're not going to do anything in the near term. We're going to only seek long, you know, this, you know, raised earth sort of approach to um, uh, change. I, can I just add, um, you know, I, I've been on a few panels uh, of, of this kind now. Um, and I think it's important to sort of also understand um, when we talk about sort of reform and trying to reduce violence um, by the police, that we're really talking about both an organization and an activity. So there's the police, um, uh, like the police in Minneapolis, and then there's an activity called policing. Um, and policing uh, has a, a, a broader and in some ways a far more fraught history, in part because of the ways in which uh, private actors take it upon themselves, as as happened in Georgia, uh, Georgia with uh, Ahmad Arbery, uh, take it upon themselves to engage in a kind of law enforcement peacekeeping uh, operation. And so, uh, when we talk about uh, defunding the police, or we talk about thinking about change, I think it's also important to understand that um, uh, the downstream effects that that has on a, the larger uh, phenomenon of policing. Great. So uh, the third set of questions we have today um, get more at some of the, the funding issues and challenges. And so the question is, what type of roadblocks exist in the way of defunding, um, whether it's contractual ob obligations, union obligations, state or federal grant funding or direct funding? Uh, and so what, what type of logistical, contractual, other types of funding roadblocks exist to actually formally carry out shifting budgets? Well, I can traditional policing to other sources. Yeah. So I can speak a little to this. Um, I also teach state and local government law um, here at, at Duke. And so um, the, there's lots of, uh, structural um, barriers might be a bit too strong to say, but structural features about policing uh, in the states uh, that have to be uh, managed in order to actually accomplish a, um, a, a redistribution or, or a, a reallocation project of defunding the police. Uh, one is that some, uh, as happened in Minneapolis, some uh, municipal charters, the, the very thing that makes them into cities, have in their charters uh, provisions about a police force. And some have, in fact, uh, as uh, was suggested in the Minneapolis scenario, a city charter that actually has a provision about requiring funding for a police force. Uh, so that's one structural feature that's um, an aspect that um, that um, it might complicate uh, just a sort of um, simple legislative act by a uh, city council. The other thing to be uh, mindful of is that there are, uh, uh, in some ways, overlapping and nested structures of policing in America. So uh, counties uh, have sheriff's departments. Some of these sheriff's departments are actually created by state constitutions. And so it's not really just a matter of uh, eliminating the local municipal police because that still leaves a uh, police apparatus at the uh, county level that might have overlapping jurisdiction. And because it's a, uh, in some cases, not all cases, but some cases a broader 
um, constituency may not be as sympathetic to some of the concerns of the municipality. Uh, and then we have, of course, the level of uh, not only state but federal enforcement um, uh, where uh, that constituency is nationwide. Um, so there is jurisdiction uh, for federal law enforcement in states. Um, and we're seeing right now in places like Portland uh, and Chicago, um, the federal government sort of pushing its authority to engage in uh, policing with its own forces uh, to, um, to its limits. And so when we think about th this project of reallocating resources, it's important to understand just how complicated and overlapping the streams uh, uh, of police enforcement uh, and policing are in the United States. Um, yeah, there's a lot, sorry, there's a lot there. Uh, 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 we have similar problems with uh, uh, the overlapping, uh, overlapping police forces here in Oakland. We have CHP, we have the Oakland Police, sorry, we have the California Highway Patrol, we have the Oakland Police Department, we have the Alameda County Sheriff's Department. Uh, right now, with respects to our protests, we're dealing with mutual aid concerns where the Oakland Police Department is claiming that they don't do anything wrong, but uh, 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 when the Alameda County Sheriff's Department comes into town, that, 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 that you know, it might be them using, you know, you know uh, 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 munitions. Uh, also, when the Oakland Unified School District uh, got rid of its police department, uh, uh, which, which we think of as a great success, uh, during the next uh, city council meeting in Oakland, the Oakland Police Department applied for uh, a contract to service the Oakland Unified School District. So, you know, when, you know, one police department loses the money, there's always another who's trying to pick up the contract. Uh, similarly, the uh, Peralta schools kicked out the Alameda County Sheriff's Department uh, from its college campuses and that and, and, and they're reapplying for that contract as well. Um, in Oakland, we're dealing with measure, uh, a, 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 a municipal measure that makes a staffing floor uh, uh, for policing. And so, although we have momentum to defund the police right now, uh, we're going to have to launch a ballot initiative and, and get rid of that, uh, uh, get rid of that, that, that measure if we're going to hope to uh, uh, really make the substantial change that we want. Um, uh, the police unions are a huge impediment. Uh, they're very strong uh, uh, in, in all municipalities. They're well-funded, they're well-resourced. Uh, and it's really difficult for local politicians to come out as uh, against the police. Once you've done it once, you're kind of branded that forever, and it really makes it difficult for you to uh, advance uh, uh, politically. So anyone who's hoping for a higher position has to maintain a re relationship with law enforcement uh, and can't tend to do so. Uh, and then uh, I just wanted to dip back uh, 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 to a comment uh, Christy made b before about Vallejo uh, when they cut their police in half during the recession, uh, um, it's really important to underscore that at the same time they cut a lot of other departments as well. And so as Christy was saying, it's really important that when we talk about defund, we're always talking about investing in community, right? Always, always, always. And so I think one of the things when defund went across the country as it did, uh, the investing community kind of got lost. Uh, uh, in, in the flood of things. And so, it, you know, it's kind of been weaponized against us in some regards. Uh, and so I appreciate uh, you, Christy, for lifting that up because it's really important for anyone who's trying to come uh, uh, join the uh, defund campaign. Yeah, I actually, um, I, I actually, um, I, I do see that as the, the major flaw or the major downside of the defund uh, language, although I actually, kind of like the defund language, honestly, for some reasons that we might get into, but I definitely see that is the downside, which is why I do always like to, to raise it up. Um, but I do, so I think that the issue of the complexity of the, of the obstacles standing in the way to effective defunding, you know, reimagining, taking, you know, this divesting, investing sort of approach is, um, is as, as, as both um, Professor Miller and Mr. Birch have said, is very much about um, attitudes and education um, when, you know, if you have a situation where, um, and I'm, you know, if you get rid of the Oakland school police and now the people are going to respond to the Oakland city police, have you just gone from frying pan to fire? It's unclear. And in order to sort of 
to, to make that not be the situation, and you need two things. First, the investing in all the situations, which will, um, in all the systems that will make those calls less necessary, but also you, you need to be working up at the level of education, getting people more comfortable with less policing, right? Because otherwise you do get to a situation and, and, it's, and it's hard because you don't wanna just hold back waiting for the, for, you know, the world to catch up because you'll never get anywhere. But at the same time, if you get too far ahead, you can easily end up in a, in a worse place because there are all these layers of law enforcement. There are the school police and then the city police and then the county police. And as we've seen, the federal um, authorities under some administrations will have no hesitation to step in where they think um, there is any, you know, purported reason to be there, right? So I think it's really important that you, that we think about um, the education component of this and getting people comfortable with the idea. I mean, I think the one other thing else, or I guess the one other thing about, just to underscore the complexity of all the different ways, you, things you have to think about, um, for me at least it's helpful to think about policing in three different buckets. One is the kind of policing um, that the police are currently doing that nobody should be doing. And in that bucket, I would put things like policing for revenue rather than public safety. I would put things like criminalizing poverty and addiction, right? Um, there's just no reason we, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna arrest our way or incarcerate our way out of homelessness or, 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 or addiction um, and, you know, and improve cities economic stability through policing. And so that's just stuff we should just take off the table. So there's one set of obstacles to doing that. Um, to getting rid of that. And then there's the kind that the stuff that I'll put in the bucket of the stuff that police are doing that other people could do more effectively, uh, maybe even more cost effectively and, and probably with less harm. And that's little things like taking traffic accident reports and writing parking tickets. And it's really big things like, you know, doing violence intervention and prevention and making public spaces welcoming and, 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 and safe for people. Um, and that's a lot of stuff that right now we're putting a almost all of that in the police bucket. There are definitely groups doing that, but they're not appreciated and grossly underfunded. And we put most of our, of that, you know, re, of those resources and, 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 and hope and responsibility in policing. Whole different set of, of obstacles to face when you're trying to undo that. And that's where a lot of your um, investing in those other entities comes in. And then there's a the third bucket, which I think many people think this is in, op in opposition to abolition, but I'm not sure that it is, at least if you change a few words around and think long term. And I put that thought that the, the things that police are doing that we want police to keep doing, or at least somebody like that we can call it whatever we want in the long term future. We just want them to do it a lot better um, in a non-racist way, in a non-harming way. And I'm not entirely sure what goes in that bucket, even for myself. Um, and I'm certainly not sure what other people would put in that bucket. But I think things we can think about putting in that bucket are things like responding to active shooters, responding when there's an armed bank robbery going on, protecting protesters who are exercising their First Amendment rights in a way that is fair, right, um, and effective. Um, and, and, and I think the reason that for me, I keep that bucket there um, is partly what uh, Professor Miller was saying earlier that um, I just think is a, and maybe I'm just being too cynical, but I worry about that if we got rid of that, we would have armed vigilantes um, roaming the streets to protect themselves. And I don't, I want the state and I, you know, I want us to come together and come up with a group that picks the best people, the most objective people, the most patient people, the, the most physically and morally courageous people to do that work um, and, make, and make sure that they do it well. I don't want to leave that. And I think, you know, Ahmed Arbery tell, you know, gives us a, a terrible example of, of the kind of um, situations you might see more of the more we, if we were to move away from that. And I think you might see a counter response to that that could be, you know, pretty disruptive as well. So I, that's why I keep that bucket alive. But, I, but that's a whole other set of, of uh, challenges and obstacles to um, addressing that part of policing. So I think for me, those three buckets helps me at least understand the complexity of how, of, of the challenges um, that we, that we face as we try to, to reimagine um, what policing is today. And if I could just weigh in about one, one, one more point that Professor Lopez was talking about. I mean, that, that's why this moment I think is so significant because there is um, widespread alignment um, sort of in the political sphere uh, about the very things that uh, used to be um, uh, discussed as kind of an outlier position. So to the extent that uh, this is a um, 
a structural problem throughout government, not just a local government problem, but throughout government, and that there is nationwide attention to it, that that's an opportunity. To the extent that um, the opioid crisis has turned drug addiction uh, from a, you know a problem of minority communities that is reflective of some kind of fault to a social problem in which compassion and intervention is necessary. That is an opportunity to, to form coalitions for the kind of change um, that that I think is necessary. I have a, just a brief follow-up question. I think James and Christy may have more to say about it. But for our law students who want to get involved in thinking about police defunding and police funding. How do you get information as a good reader of documents, a well-trained law student, regarding just how the municipal budget works and how police spend their money? How transparent is it? How much digging does it take to actually figure out what activities that we care about are funded or are not funded by, by a county and municipality and where the money that we spend on policing goes? Uh, it's, uh, it depends how deep you want to go. Uh, I mean, like we can go, we can go download, we can go download the budget. You know, you can get a copy of the budget uh, and get a basic understanding. Uh, uh, but it's for for me in attempts to educate other people uh, um, who who have never seen a budget before how to read these things. Um, the conversation is always about how the information we want is deliberately obscured. You know, and so. For instance, when we're talking about the police budget, when the city analyzes how much money the police get, they'll include restricted fund dollars uh, 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 and, and say that the police only get, for instance, like 22% of uh, Oakland city budget. For those of you who don't know, restricted fund dollars are, 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 are essentially dollars that the uh, 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 city, the, our city council doesn't have the discretion to uh, put in any one direction, right? And so including those in, a, in an analysis of city council's function doesn't really make any sense because they can't really do anything about that, right? When the reality is the money that they can do something about, uh, uh, they put 46% of that, of that money into uh, the Oakland Police Department. And so there are many tricks that they have to, uh, you know, make it hard for people to understand. And then when it comes to the police budget itself, it's very difficult to get information about where they're getting their money from, where it's going, uh, how much individual officers are getting paid, what the compensation looks like, uh, um, because they know if we got all of this information, uh, the critiques would be damning. The critiques of what they're doing with the money would be damning. Uh, uh, and, and we know that here in Oakland because we're finally starting to get that information because of the local pressure that we have. We have a city council member who's been asking for the information and we found out that you know about uh, uh, conservatively 50% of the things that the Oakland Police Department is doing are in the categories that we've all been talking about in the bucket of things that other people can do, right? And they don't want us to know that because we know that we'll attack their budget and we'll get that money. Uh, uh, and then when we get that money, their power will decrease uh, uh, because their union will lose strength because their, 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 their class size will be stronger. They're slowly decrease in strength uh, and I think that's a really important point because the money for them to maintain their positions is one of the ways that they maintain power through the size of their union. All right, uh, you know, one of the things, um, uh, it's not unique to lawyers, but um, um, one of the things that people can do if they're interested is is really stay engaged in, you know, local, county, state, um, uh, politics. Um, uh, the, you know, this is a nationwide phenomenon. Uh, you know, everybody, not only in the United States, but the world's uh, attention has been focused on Minneapolis. But in the typical uh, case, uh, municipal elections are low turnout affairs. They're not, they're, they're scheduled, you know, on, uh, on off cycle, um, and uh, very few people show up for them. Um, and so, uh, if anything, part of what um, the story about, um, you know, what happened in Minneapolis um, and it has happened across uh, the country uh, should tell us is that, 
uh, people that want change need to influence um, their political leaders and hold them accountable. And that can only happen when you actually educate yourself about who's running for city council, what are their positions on um, uh, social services. Um, and that's really, um, you know, uh, hopefully something that we'll see in terms of a, of a change rather than showing up every four years, you know, in a presidential election, you're, you're on it. Um, every every two years. I, you know, I think this question really underscores how there's room in this movement for everyone, um, because we do need so we need to be so much better educated about how cities work and about how city budgets work. Um, I know when we were doing the Ferguson investigation, that was honestly the first time I had ever really dug into city budgets, and I found them confounding. Um, and it was it took me talking with experts and working with my team a lot to figure out what they were even trying to say and so i you know and and to be you know a lot of people would do a better job of that than i am because i'm like not just to be i'm not good with numbers to be quite honest but but nonetheless you know i'm I, i'm no dolt either and it was it was really hard to figure those things out and i think that we should be working from, we should be working in high schools and in middle schools to educate students. This should be part, you know, it is wonderful that we know what a bicameral Congress is and that, you know, that's, those are important things, but we also should know how our local governments work. And we don't teach kids that, and we should be teaching, and that's something that organizers can be doing and teachers can be doing, is helping people understand their local budgets and helping how all these different budgets intersect. You know, those three buckets I was talking about, some of those things to address, you're going to be mostly focused at the city municipal level. A lot of them are going to be focused at the county level, a lot of like county health systems and things. That's your city can't do anything with that, or at least can't do a lot with that. And then some stuff at the state level, you know, so you've really got to know what your state is doing. And you have to know how all those different things are, are, are working together. And that's not easy. And it, um, I think if we were, we um, worked as a society to educate um, everyone from an early age on up uh, and what all of that means, we would be a much more informed citizenry and much more better able to govern um, ourselves um, and to understand what's going on. We have time for one more question and we, then we really want to turn it over and I've been seeing great questions come through on the chat and so I'm really looking forward to to sharing all those with, with, you, with you here on the group. Uh, we've talked about this a tiny bit. We'd love to hear your your thoughts on the claims that defunding the police would lead to an escalation in crime rates. And that raises this question, what is the actual effect of our current law enforcement system on crime prevention? And we all know already that there have been claims that even, even protesting the police is, is causing an escalation in crime rates and endangers our public safety. Just calling to question policing is a public safety threat. And so we, we all know that public safety will be the rallying cry uh, among opponents to defunding the police. Interested in your thoughts about how to respond to those claims and how to have a, a, a good public debate about this. So I, I will, one thing I, I can say, um, you know, having done this work um, in all, every single place we ever went, we were told that people were going to die because of the work that we were doing just changing policing as it was. Um, and um, there, especially after Ferguson, there was something called the Ferguson effect and James Comey, Comey famously said that there's a chill wind blowing and officers are afraid to do anything. Rahm Emanuel said something similar in Chicago. And, and, and the research tends to show that no, actually, um, you know, making police behave lawfully does not, um, uh, increase crime. In fact, it often improves crime. And you know, the example I gave of Vallejo is one example. There's another example in Stockton right down the road, about 60 miles from Vallejo, where they actually cut policing. It's not perfect, but they cut policing without an increase in crime or in violence, right? And they, and they just took a very different approach if you want to look at that. Um, so that's just even within that. And then when we talk about cutting policing, you know, many of the departments we went to afterwards were smaller than when we started. Um, Ferguson's a great example. They went from 54 officers to 38 officers. They went from one black officer to now 17 black officers, eight female officers. Um, and their crime, although crime in St. Louis is up, crime in Ferguson is down. Um, so you, you don't, this is, there's not this sort of you know, straight trade off. And, and as we've been talking about, a lot of policing doesn't go to crime prevention actually anyway. And the research as, as a whole seems to show that policing has some, but actually a pretty small impact on um, crime rates at best, right? So 
and that to me just begs the question, that's before you've even tried and even supported all these other ways of preventing crime and intervening in crime that might be less harmful. Um, so it, 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 it seems to me, again, it's part of the education and helping people, you know, pushing them even as we help them catch up um, to get people comfortable with the idea that um, we, we really can um, be safer um, and have less harm. Um, with less policing. And many police officers that I've talked to for over 20 years now, all across the country, know that they are doing too much, know that they're being expected to fix problems they have no ability or way to fix. And it's in many respects just listening to that and taking it to its logical conclusion, which is then why are you here trying to do that? Somebody else should be here trying to do that. You yourself know that you can't. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't, I, that's not anti-police. That's um, not, you know, blind to the, the threat of crime. Um, it's just trying to be more sensible about how to keep us all safe. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have any uh, great insight uh, and I don't have the sort of empirical chops to tell you about um, crime rates and the relationship to policing just because it's a multi-factor, you know, multi-factor, multivariable, um, set of factors, and I just don't have the kind of skill set to be able to to assess it. I, you know, I will say at a kind of thirty thousand foot level, a couple of things. One is I think um, um, uh, Professor Roth that um, um, studied homicide years ago um, on American homicide, and I think one of the key takeaways was that um, when there is widespread distrust of authority. Uh, including the police department, that leads to the increase in homicide. So, you know, one answer is uh, to to the issue is well, I, I'm not sure that you get much better uh, scenario in terms of crime rates if the the you know if the police department is not trusted um, by the constituents that they're acting any way. So you're not you're not better off. I lost uh, Daryl. Oh, looks like I looks like I froze a little bit. It happens. Sorry, I can't. Remember. It, it, the The point that I was trying to make was that distrust in the police. Um, um, if you don't have a, a, a police department that is trustworthy, that can have an effect on sort of for homicide rates, for example. And the other uh, point I think that is uh, worth remembering, you know, when we think about this is. Um, that um, you know, failure to to uh, punish the the guilty is also a form of oppression. Um, it's a really difficult one to sort of unpack, but that's also a, a piece of this, and that's sort of the history of policing in America um, is um, not only uh, punishing the innocent, but um, uh, protecting the guilty, um, which goes back to Professor Lopez's point that you know we need to have. Uh, trust in the policing function. Yeah, I think um, uh, I don't have the stats chops as well, uh, but I will tell you that in Oakland in, in, in I think late 90s, early 2000s, our police budget was maybe 100 million a year, 120 million a year. Uh, and now here it is 2020 and our police budget is, you know, 340 some odd million a year. Uh, uh, and, and, and if you look at conventional crime rates, you're not going to see uh, that money going doing much of anything. Uh, um, and then the other thing I'll say is I don't have the stats in front of me, I should have brought them, but there uh, are a good amount of studies uh, on programs that are cheap in comparison that are demonstrated to increase public safety, investing in community-based organizations, uh, uh, you know, so you, you know, that's a, that's a Google search away, all the programs uh, that can serve in that regard. So when we think of how much money is going into policing, you know, what could you do with an investment of $100 million into programs designed to improve public safety from a non-policing perspective? I'd love to turn to some of the questions we've been getting on the chat. Um, there are two questions that are related, so maybe I could pose them to you together. And we briefly touched on, on some of this. Uh, one question is just, uh, we've talked about this, but the power of police unions 
and how can the reform movement overcome that power or um, respond to the, the, that power? Any comments on, on police unions and their role in these reform conversations and efforts? You can, you can draw them out into the open uh, uh, and force them to engage in conversation, I mean, strategically. Uh, like if they're, um, a lot of times the negotiating from our perspective happens uh, away from the public, whether we're talking about the local level or the state level, uh, whether, you know, whether we're lobbying for, you know, and so uh, oftentimes they're allowed to negotiate behind closed doors. And so from a advocacy perspective, um, going on the offensive openly and forcing them to respond to situations. For instance, we're pushing a decertification bill at the state level uh, and cops are always saying that they don't want there to be bad apples, then they should love this decertification bill that would decertify bad officers and they should agree with all the provisions in it. And so if we say that loudly and proudly and force them to uh, come out and state their position or state what type of amendments they wanna take, uh, it makes it more difficult for them uh, to maintain uh, politically unpopular positions. Yeah, I think, I think unions, one thing to keep in mind with police unions is that in many, um, in many cities, they've taken on a function that is very, very different than what unions normally do. Um, unions are normally meant to protect workers and to make sure that their wages and benefits are fair and, you know, to, you know, to sort of be a, a bulwark against management. The history of police unions and the way that they've evolved. Um, in many places, police unions specifically arose because the agencies were trying to hire black officers and a union would form in order to try to keep out black officers. Um, uh, PANO, a union in New Orleans, is an example of that and there are others. In other places, you will see that even if there were, that wasn't formalized, even as police departments have become majority minority, the union leadership will often remain very white. And I just think that it is if, we, if you need to understand that about unions to understand part of what they have become. You can look at the, um, you can look at the document that the FO, national FOP put together when Trump was elected that includes their wish list for the world, including getting rid of DACA. What does that have to do with policing? And again, it's as part of this identity of many unions um, and the national unions. And in the way that plays out locally sometimes is that unions will trade off benefits that would inure to their entire membership, like pay raises, in exchange for things that benefit to the worst officers, like protections from being interviewed quickly after a shooting or getting rid of disciplinary files. Those protections protect the worst, the bad apples, allow them to infect the entire barrel um, and at, at the cost of a pay raise. And the, one of the reasons that happens is because city officials find it a, a really convenient way to balance budgets. I cannot give a pay raise to the police force and just give them this harmless, you know, 48 hour rule um, or getting rid of their disciplinary records after a year. It costs me nothing. Well, of course it does. It can sometimes cost you not only legitimacy and your integrity, but also millions of dollars in um, civil suits. Um, but that's sort of buried down the line. So I think that part of it is just really being aware of that and, and holding your officials accountable to negotiate the right deal and not let themselves be captured by unions. Um, and, and not, I think many times those of us who think of ourselves as progressive, um, you know, like, hey, but unions are good. It's like, this is a different animal. This is a different kind of thing and it's not operating the way it's meant to. And you just need to be aware of that as you're trying to um, uh, contend with all of the harm that police unions do. Another question about, uh, petty crime enforcement and what, what the response is to people who say, no, 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 we don't see that as part of the bucket that could be done by others or that policing shouldn't be done because petty crime, quality of life policing, that's really important to stop more serious crime. We need it to stop more serious crime. You know, that was the success of Giuliani in New York City and that, that, that everyday policing is really, really important to public safety. What, what are, your, are your responses to those types of comments about stepping back from that type of petty police enforcement. So, um, I'll do, sorry, I'll, I'm happy to let someone else talk. But, okay, so I, I just, this is one of my pet peeves. Um, you know, it is 
has always been the case, you know, since broken windows that we've recognized that um, the health of communities helps prevent crime. But one of the things that was glossed over, even in that article, um, broken windows and a lot of community policing since then, is that a lot of the things that article was reporting on were improvements in communities that weren't done by police. <laughs> they were done by improving playgrounds, by parks and recs, by just, you know, again, investing in communities separate and apart from policing. And so we've really got this outsized uh, view of policing's role in helping to keep community safety. It is in fact true that if communities look, I mean, at least the, what the research seems to show is that if communities look better and feel more welcoming publicly and in fact are more welcoming publicly, then communities are healthier and they do, there is less violence, but there's no, there, we don't necessarily need, we, in fact, there's a lot of harm and a lot of cost and inefficiencies to having policing, um, police be the ones to try to achieve those and criminalizing those things um, we don't need to actually send people to jail or to cite them to get them doing these things. There's a lot of community organizations that can achieve that same behavior without using the criminal processes. Um, and there's like, you know, Patrick Sharkey talks about this in his book from several years ago on Easy Peace. Lots of people talk about this. Um, it's not, this isn't, you know, uh, you know, uh, really kind of out there thinking. This is pretty solid, you know, social science behind this. And we've just not, we've allowed ourselves to stray very far from that. We have a whole group of great additional questions that are rolling in. Um, two questions that kind of belong together is a question about, for our students who are on university campuses, the role of defunding in conversations about campus police and having armed law enforcement on campuses and relatedly, but different, SROs and armed police officers in, in schools in general, in elementary schools, high schools, what are your thoughts on um, defunding and what approach we should have towards the role of law enforcement in schools of different types? I don't think uh, law enforcement should be in our schools. Um, the Black Organizing Project in Oakland uh, has done incredible work on this for the last 10 years to finally get uh, Oakland's very own, uh, OUSD's very own police department out of their schools. Um, with regards to campuses, uh, I've been talking to some folks up here who are going through this and what I've encouraged them to do is just think about all of the money that's being spent in their public safety budget, right? Like you're your own municipality, you have a public safety budget, what do you want that money going towards? And I think people will be shocked how much it costs to have uh, uh, law enforcement and security on campus uh, and, and, you know, shocked at how little are spent on other services that people on campus need, whether it be a response to interpersonal violence or, 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 or mental health services or, or anything else that, that, that those on campus can imagine can keep them safe. And so I really encourage folks on campus to take agency to bring this conversation uh, to their own folks uh, uh, and see what you can do and see how y'all wanna keep yourself safe. So, um... I mean, this is a really, really difficult question because I think I come from it from the, you know, sort of the firearms law side and sort of understanding this in terms of the big structural issues about um, the proliferation of firearms. I mean, a lot of, especially in suburban communities, but the, a lot of the concern about having police in schools has been prompted by mass shootings in schools by other students. Um, and, um, it's uh, a low probability event. It doesn't happen that often, um, but compared to other countries where it happens not at all, um, you know, I think there's a sort of sense that the base rate should be zero. Uh, and so it's a highly salient event um, that I think has led to this uh, concern about what do we do to ensure that schools are safe. Um, and why I say this is a, a, a pretty difficult problem is because to the extent that uh, you don't have an authorized um, body um, that is able to uh, use sort of coercive force within a school or within a university, um, there's always the possibility um, that that kind of authority will be delegated uh, to people uh, over which you have no control. 
so the in the firearms law area, the movement for campus carry um, in response to shootings on college campuses, um, I think would end up um, getting a, a boost actually if in fact you know, if you were at a, a university in Texas and said, not only um, uh, am I allowed to carry a pistol here into my classroom, but also there's no actual um, Texas, there's no security apparatus here in in the state except um, the, the student body itself. And I think that might lead to uh, uh, outcomes that, that wouldn't be so good. Yeah, I think um, so. I guess one thing is to think about is that oftentimes campus police are not armed and in that way they actually provide a model for how we can police without guns. Um, so I think that's interesting and I'm not quite ready to completely get rid of that. At the same time, um, and I this is just something that's maybe out there and I, I just don't know about it, but it's not clear to me, um, you know, we all have a terrible example of Parkland where having armed law enforcement didn't do a lot of good. And I don't know whether we have the numbers to know and I suspect that it might change in different communities how much gun violence is actually being um, prevented um, or serious violence is being prevented. Although I definitely take Professor Miller's um, uh, point about if you get rid of them, the fear will rise and people will want, you know, it's the Ahmed Arbery point again in some respects, right? Um, but the other issue that I, I think is really important to be thinking about right now is the one that Oakland is, is facing is when you don't have, um, when you get rid of the school police, then you're going to have that, that other layer of police that will now be responding more and what are the consequences of that. And I just think that that's something that you need to obviously have a sense of before you go that route and take steps to make sure that you don't end up worse off than you were otherwise. Um, but Overall, I do think that especially, there's no question in my mind that in high schools and below, for sure, we don't want police anywhere near on campus in an ideal world. Um, you, I, I, I think, you know, that's, that's my perspective. Again, I'm happy to, like, if there are numbers that oh, they're actually preventing all this gun violence and we can revisit that. But what I find really, really sad is when you talk to students who are like, I love my school resource officer. He talks to me. He listens to me. It's like, well, you know, you could have two counselors for that school resource officer. Or, you know, you don't need someone with a gun and a badge and criminal law enforcement to be your friend and to be your counselor and to give you guidance. Like, that's really sad to me that we're training students to, to look at the criminal justice system for that kind of guidance. I'm not sure that that's healthier or needed. Um, and so I, and I think that's something, I don't know, I just think that that's something to really be mindful of as we're thinking about um, even the, the supposed benefits of having police in schools. Okay, thank you. Well, we have about a minute left. Does anyone want to add any last words to our, our law students about work that they can do? There's a lot of litigation going on. There's a lot of policing research, policy work at the local, state, national level. There's a lot for engaged students to work on. Any last words on how folks in the audience could get involved, should they choose to be? Uh, yes, for sure. Uh, um, support local organizers who have been engaged in this work uh, for the long term. They need people uh, with your skills and understanding to go and divest those skills and understanding into their communities. I know I've had great success here in Oakland. There are a bunch of budget whizzes running around Oakland, right? Uh, uh, because of the work that we're doing with Defund OPD. Uh, and so I think it's really our responsibility to take these gifts uh, uh, and give them to the people so they can empower them to make the change that we're talking about because it's going to take uh, it's going to take a whole lot of us uh, uh, to, to make the changes that, that, that we're all talking about here. I, I, yeah, I, I'll just add really quickly, you know, this is the area where I think um, lawyers as kind of um, uh, facilitators and thought leaders and working at the vanguard rather than it sort of as uh, reactions to uh, circumstances is is really important. Um, so, you know, this is where the the role of lawyers in um, in working with advocacy organizations and ad advising um, um, municip municipalities and thought leaders about um, you know the, the legal 
circumstances of change um, is a, really an opportunity as opposed to waiting until something bad happens and, and then you know um, uh, reacting with with um, impact litigation or 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 whatever which is important um, but um, is a, a doesn't pre doesn't necessarily prevent the problem I can't top either of those two closing statements. I'll just say thank you um, for having me and, and, and I really appreciated hearing the, um, the thoughts of my fellow panelists. Thank you all so much. And thank you all for, for tuning in. Um, for those of you who want to get involved more in this work here in the Triangle, Durham, Duke, North Carolina area, please feel free to get in touch with me. There's plenty to do here and there's plenty to do with organizations around the country like Mr. Birch's. Uh, thank you, Christy Lopez, Daryl Miller, James Birch for, for joining us today. Thank those of you participating and sending questions today and those of you who will watch this online later. And really, really, again, thank the students for, for the hard work you uh, did to make this event possible. Uh, really wonderful work and I hope this is the first of many conversations and we hope that you all get engaged and talk to us more in the future. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you everyone for attending um, and please uh, be on the lookout for additional events that uh, DERP along with our other along with the other organizations will be hosting on police and immigration matters this semester. Have a good day.